Hello. Today, let's learn about the spiritual life of Saul and the spiritual life of David. Let's look at the scriptures first. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shocho, which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Shocho and Azekah in Ephesdamim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and the Israelites stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, who, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me, and kill me, then... He will be, be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servant and serve us. I think it was about five years ago. Five years ago, the pastor taught us how to counterattack. As we live our spiritual lives, he said, there is a sound which we must never listen to because it means God wouldn't work. That is something you must never listen to. God will surely work through us. The pastor taught us in that moment, those words struck my heart very greatly. A sound that we must never listen to as we live our spiritual lives. Because if you listen, it means that God wouldn't work. Then, in my heart, I began to erase the thoughts that God wouldn't work in me. And then, God will surely work through me. That was the heart that began to find me. God will surely work. Simply changing my thoughts from cha thinking that God wouldn't work to God will surely work. As I began to change my thoughts, amazing change began happening in my heart. I became extremely happy. I think it was in 1987, probably, when I was sent to prison. Because I was released in 2003. When I was sent to prison, I got to see the reason why it was that I had no choice but to end up in prison. When I came across a thought or a problem in my heart, I would always think, no, this is too much for me to handle alone. That's impossible. This is difficult. Thoughts like these were always in my heart. The background at which I was sent to prison in, even when I think about it, after I graduated high school, for me to kick off my life in society, I got onto a train and got off at Yongsan Station, Seoul. I had to find a job. 
I started searching for a job. But there was no job that was right for me. And because I was so hungry, I had no choice. There was an advertisement on the power power line pole, and it was uh, it was a sewing machine factory employee recruitment ad. And I called the sewing machine factory, and I got a job at the sewing machine factory. I got a job at the sewing machine factory now. The factory boss came to me and you know, made me do work. When you wake up tomorrow morning, you need to clean the factory, sweep the factory floors, and after you swept, mop it, and then you have to get ready to go to work. And he tasked me with various different jobs. The next day, I got up. I picked up a broom. And I was about to clean the factory floors. But I felt so embarrassed and ashamed. For how long do I need to be cleaning the factory floor in my life? And I felt really miserable for my luck. The elders back at the village told me that I'm going to become a really great man one day. But someone who is going to be a great man is here on a factory floor cleaning and mopping. And if anyone from the village were to find out, I felt that I'd be letting the village elders down. So I said, nope, I can't, I can't be doing this crap. So I threw down my broom on the ground and I walked out. After that now, because I stayed in Seoul, I needed to make a living. And after walking into the factory, I would always think, I can't do this. I have to quit this. I have to stop this. And these thoughts continued to rise up inside me. So I would quit and find another job at another factory and I would quit again because the work was too much and I would get another job at another factory and again I would quit because I don't like the factory manager and again because I quit, I quit because uh, the factory system is no good. And that's how I live my life. And I've been doing that and I became so hungry and I had to make some money somehow. And after I got a job in the factory, I was supposed to have gotten paid to buy food because I was hungry. But because I didn't know how to make a, how to make money without having to work for it. So I thought after others put in the hard work to earn their money, I would steal that and rob them and con them. That was the only way I could come up with to live an easy life. So I started stealing. I started stealing and really didn't turn profit. Because I was earning money, but because my heart felt so uneasy, I would waste all the money I earned from stealing to uh, waste it all on my entertainment. And because every time I would keep that up for a year, a couple of years, and my pockets would always be empty. I can't keep doing this. There's no way for me to win like this. That's right. Let me do a big one. Just one shot deal. Would there not be a one shot deal? So what's a one way to do a one shot deal? That is to do a big job. So I got some info about a cash transport truck and their right routes and times. Then I'll rob a cash transport truck for a really big score. Then after that job, I get, I get out of stealing for good. So I was rushing, robbing the cash transport and then I was caught for, and in prison for robbery and murder. But even after I was imprisoned, I couldn't fit in because 
There are difficulties in the prison as well. Always. When there are difficulties or problems in my heart, I think, I can't do this, I have to quit, I have to give up. Because these thoughts are inside me, at the slightest difficulty, I would start fights and arguments. I couldn't fit in at the prison. And back when I was attending school, I would always, I could never fit in at school. At the slightest difficulty, I said, I can't. I don't want that. I, I don't want it. These thoughts would arise, so I couldn't fit in at school. And living in society, going into a job, I couldn't fit in. I couldn't fit in at a prison. Others, they get a job at the factory. They can sweep, they can clean, face difficulties, face problems, receive a month's salary and live happily. But for me, at the slightest difficulty, I say, I can't, that's too annoying, that's too hard, I gotta quit. Because I think like this, I could easily get jobs, but I could never fit into living with that job. So for me, something easy, and a comfortable way for me to earn money, for me, was where other people work hard to earn money, I would steal it, I would rob it, I would uh, con them. And so, I went down the path of a criminal. And doing that, in 2003, 1987, I was uh, prosecuted and imprisoned. And I received salvation in 1991. And because of sin, I was going through suffering, but I received salvation. And it made me so happy. After receiving salvation, I was, so, I was living such a happy life inside the prison. In 2003, I was released, and I went into the church. And inside the church, I went into the missionary school. I was dispatched from the missionary school, and as a gospel preacher, I was dispatched. As I was dispatched as a missionary, until now, about five years, until five years ago, I was living the life that of a pastor. I was living that of a, I was living a life that of a pastor, but still, always, before, when I was living in prison, I still kept within me the mindset that the inmates had when they were in prison. Because even as I was living in a life of ministry, it was difficult. And when there were problems, I would always tell myself, oh no, that's too much. Gotta quit, I gotta stop. I think that's how I lived. Even as I was living as a pastor, there are problems and difficulties. And when problems would come, I would say, me? Oh, God is going to surely help me. God is surely going to work in me. That, you know, thinking like that, there's no problem. Even as I was living in my ministry, even when the slightest difficulties or the problems would come to my life, then in my heart, what I continue to feel is, no, gotta quit, gotta stop. When I was in Ansan, I was in charge of a big church as I was living in ministry, but I felt very difficult inside my heart. I thought, this isn't gonna work, I gotta quit. I gotta quit now. That's what I was thinking again. And so, until about five, five years before, that's how I've been living my life. And so, I have no choice but to be ruined in my life, I have no choice but to go to prison, and this was one of the reasons why. It's because I thought, I thought to myself, I can't. So even as I was living ministry, I was failing. I do feel grateful in one corner of my heart, but on the other corner, I do feel grateful and happy, but when there are difficulties and problems, I think to myself, God's not going to work. It doesn't seem like God's going to work at all doesn't seem like God's going to listen to my prayers. And these are the thoughts that I kept within me as I lived my life. And because I've been living like that until five years before, the pastor, during the Bible crusade, he called all the pastors from across the country and told me, and he would have fellowship with me. And what the pastor said was, <clears throat> he said, 
everyone I have, I'm going to make all of you into the world best pastor. But in order for you to become a world best pastor, everyone, there is one slight issue. I'm telling you exactly how to become the world's best pastors today. But after hearing these words, you have, there will be people who will do exactly as I tell them, and there will be people who won't do exactly as I tell them. And later, the very beginning is going to be only a paper-thin difference. It's going to be a very small little gap, it seems. But after five years, ten years later, it's going to be a huge difference. And just like that, the pastor said to us to, about how to counterattack. No matter what it is you're trying to do, whenever there are difficulties or problems, but in your heart, you're going to get a disparaging thought, saying it's not going to work, this is going to be difficult, this is going to be hard, God's not going to work. But then... Why do you stay still? Everyone, you need to fight back. Until now, the words you have heard from the church, how many are they? The words you've been listening until now, you have to counterattack with them. There is one thing that you must never hear in your life, and that that is, God is not working. It doesn't seem like God is working. When you begin to think like this, you say, no, God is surely going to work. Now this is how you counterattack. In your lives, there is this one thing you must never hear, and that is that God is not going to work in you. And that is one thing that you must never listen to. Because God will surely use us to work. And then in my heart, I got rid of this word saying, no. And surely God is going to work inside my heart. And so my thoughts have changed. I just have to get rid of the thoughts saying that it's not going to work. God is going to work. And from that moment on, in my life, strange things began to happen. But before, whenever difficulties and troubles would come to me, I feel like it's not going to work. Doesn't seem like God's going to work. It's going to be difficult. Those are the thoughts that I began to feel. But no, God is surely going to work. Because that's the heart that I feel. Pastor was talking about long ago in Suwon prison. He was there as a chaplain. And he was there for the inmates. And he preached the gospel to many people there during that time. But nowadays he's too busy that he's not able to continue that work. So I thought, yeah, that's right. Long ago, pastor would go to the Suwon prison. And now he's too busy. So maybe I should do that work in his place. So I began to do work with the prisons. So as I was beginning to work with the prisons, and as I was working with the prisons, there were about 10 different prisons where I was working with. And as I was working with the prisons, I was living very busily, and the pastor called me over. And he called me over and he said, You, this year, you're going to do the entire country's prisons, all of them. And, in the future, you're going to finish going to all the, working with all the prisons in Korea, and when you go to the Korean prisons, don't go by yourself. Go with two people. So you have to nurture more people who can work with the Korean prisons, and once you finish all the work with all the Korean prisons, then you go out to the rest of the world, and you get all the prisons in the world, and then you make a movie. Write books. And, you run a prison yourself. And the pastor was telling me all these things that seem impossible to me. And when I heard those words, the first thing I thought inside my heart, and that was the thought that I got, 
With what tricks up my sleeve am I to do all the prisons across the country? What I was thinking was all the, pr the airplane prices alone would not be a joke. No way. How am I supposed to do all this work? That's what I used to think. But no. But the pastor said many times, Everyone, in your lives you may hear all things, but God's not going to work in you, you should never listen to that. Because God will surely use you to work. That's the heart I felt. And so, I thought then, in order for me to do the prisons of all the world, then during the world camp, we should do a police and corrections forum. That's the heart that I felt. So if we're able to go out to all the rest of the world, and we sent out emails to all the prisons of the world, we sent out invitations, and that year, about four countries, police correctional officers from four countries came. And among the people who had come, one of them was the correctional officer from Kenya during the world camp. So these four different countries correctional officers came. They came to the world camp and they opened up their heart open wide. And during the camp, they listened to the word of the pastor. They got to hear the mind education. And then, this correctional officer from Kenya, he brought with me, uh, he brought with him a certain concern. He brought a concern with him, and what that concern was, in Kenya, in the Kenyan prisons, there are very model prisoners who are exemplary, but they were sentenced to life in prison. And for many tens of years, they've been living decades inside prisons. So anybody can tell that this person has really changed. This person has really reformed. This person may go outside the prison and he will never commit another atrocity again. And so they, they decided to uh, push for a uh, probation outside the prison and he even signed off on it and so he was sent outside the prison and so this life in prison prisoner outside the prison should do well but within just a week he killed eight people and so they had to bring him back oh, actually he, he's gone AWOL since then and they still couldn't find him and the correctional officer was in so much hardship because of that. And he talked about his worries. He said, now, who can I trust? He was so exemplary. And he lived as a sacrifice unto others. It seemed as though that he would never commit another murder ever again. But within, eight, within one week, he killed eight people. He had caused such terrible atrocities. There was no way to tell how he went wrong. And I told him the testimony about when I was released. You know, for me, in prison, six months before I was released, I began to think within myself, I thought within my heart, that if I were to leave, I would never want to come back to prison ever again. I thought that if I were to leave, I will never, go, I will never come back again. That's what I was thinking. But so many prisoners thought the same thing when they left the prison. I have I've washed my hands out of this, I'm never going back. And I've been in the prison for 16 years, and few tens of thousands of people must have been released before me. And that's how much they would determine themselves and resolute to never come back to prison. But these people came back, and not only that, in the prison, the people who are the most exemplary people. Now, who are they? They are the uh, chairman of Christian associations, chairman of Buddhist associations, and chairman of uh, Catholic associations. Inside the prison walls, they were living like angels themselves. 
But these folks, they went outside and they came right back in. When I was in prison, I was always causing problems and issues. And if I were to compare myself to those people, then I am, I am not even uh, uh, reaching up to the, you know, the dust that's on their feet. But these folks go out and they come right back in. And there's no, it's impossible for me to think that I'm not going to come back in after I leave. Oh, then I have not changed. I shouldn't go outside. Because if I get released, I'm going to come right back in. But there's no way I'm not going to leave. When I'm inside the prison, even if I may, you know, even if a person who is a junkie, a druggy junkie coming inside the prison would also quit. No matter how good a person may be at stealing, when they come inside the prison, they can't steal. No matter how severe the alcoholism, when they come inside the prison, they can't uh, drink anymore. Why? Because they quit? Because they quit drinking? Because they quit doing drugs? No, that's not how. There is no drugs inside the prison. And also, the prison wardens keep them with their guns. And that's why they have to be ruled over by the prison wardens, no matter what they do. And so, even if I want to bring a bucket of water, I have to have per uh, permission to do so. I can't do that out of my own will, because if I do, I'll be punished. So inside the prison, there has to, it has to be under the leadership and the guidance of the warden. And that's how I was able to overcome all of this cr crime. So if a person is not inside, inside the prison not committing sin, it's not that they, are, they have changed that they're not committing sin. And for a very long time, they have been not doing drugs, they have been not gambling, they have been not committing crime. They thought, they think to themselves that they are the ones not doing it. So they will go outside. But then they commit sins again. And that was the one part that I was able to see differently. Oh, while I'm inside the prison, that's when I was able to live the most clean part of my life. And I was able to overcome all these criminal inclinations. So then when I leave, even though my body is going outside, I should bring with me the walls and the fence of the prison in my heart. So when I was released in 2003, even though my body had left, I brought with me the very bars of prison with me in my heart. So that even outside, I was living like as if I was inside the prison. I'm going to receive the guidance and the ruling. That's how I was able to live. And I gave that testimony. And this person was truly touched in his heart. And so he went back to Kenya. And when he went back into Kenya, he brought me and invited me. And inside, inside Kenya, I was able to meet the, uh, the police commissioner again. And in his office, he met with me, and he grabbed a hold of my hands, and he said, I have a request of you. <clears throat> I was able to hear all the education that IYF does in Korea. There are 119 prisons in Kenya, and I am going to leave them all in your hands. No matter what it is you want to do, you can do it. Except, there is only one wish is that I want to ma many pastors like you. And that's, that's the request that he said. You know, never once have I ever thought that I'm going to start a theology school behind the bars of prison. But when I went over there, this is what the police commissioner was telling me. Prison, this is what the pr prison commissioner was telling me. So the pastor, I told the pastor this, and the pastor said, let's run a theology program. That's what happened. And then I told the commissioner, commissioner, this is great. Let's do a theology, let's run a theology school program inside the prison. And that's what I told him. And so inside the prison, we had an enrollment ceremony for the, uh, for the theology school program. And a couple of years later, we even had a graduation ceremony. This is the graduation ceremony of the theology school. And I told the prisoners, we gave them the graduation gown. We gave them the graduation cap. Uh, we made a magnificent uh, graduation uh, diploma. And we even made excellent student award. And we invited all the, all the media all across Kenya. And we also invited ministers of government functions as guest speakers. And also we got to invite all the families of all these gradu uh, graduates. And we had a very magnificent graduation ceremony. We had a very big feast. Among the VIP guests, the one uh, seated in the middle is the top government, uh, top governor of Kenya. 
and he came over. He held on to his family and he saw his father graduating from the a theology school, he shed his tears, and after we saw this, he came over again, he got to listen to the mind education, and he was just so moved. And with that, he held on to us tightly, and this governor, he held on to me. And he said, I'm so thankful for you. It'd be nice if our president finds out about this. I want to make a report about this to our president. And so he told me, also, then he went to the president and made the report. And a two, two pages uh, of this news had gone on the newspaper which is run by the president. And we were published. The prisoners, uh, the in prison inmates were graduates of a theology school and they have changed. And he talked about all their testimonies. And so the top congressman came over and he was so happy. It's such a, such a shame that only our inmates can receive this education. It's such a shame. So, in Kenya, even uh, maybe the, the most corrupt people, those who are so corrupt but haven't entered prisons yet, and there is a very, very corrupt organization, and that is the government workers. It'd be nice if you provide education for the government workers. So he introduced us to the chairman of the government workers. And so we had gathered up a lot of uh, officer ranking government officials. And as an example, we are going to implement this education. And so we had our officer in the government and we started our mind education. And mind education was doing so well at the time that starting with the chairman himself, the gentleman in the center with the glasses is the chairman of the government workers. Uh, so the chairman we had invited to the Kenya Nairobi church. And these are our students. They had the welcoming ceremony, they danced. And together we sat down for a meal. And as we sat down for a meal together, during the meal, we preached the gospel of laying of hands. And after the gospel of laying of hands, they had all received salvation. And these folks opened up their hearts open wide. And in Kenya, about 3,700 government workers of Kenya were gathered to the Mohi Stadium. There were about 3,700 people. And they invited us as mind educators. And after he in invited us, the, beginning with the chairman of the government workers, 3,700 people of government workers of the Kenyan government listened to the mind education. And after that, this education was so good, once again, what they began to think was, and all the government workers, all the officers, we're going to bring them to Korea. So for one week, we're going to give them mind education program, and they're going to learn it. So beginning with the chairman of the government workers of Kenya, uh, the, all the ranking officers in that bureau, about 15 of them had come to Korea and received mind education for one week. And after they came, everyone who came received salvation. And they met the pastor, they received salvation, they, was, they were able to eat together. And they had spent such a happy time together. And these folks, they went back to Kenya, and once again they made another event. And when they made this another event, about 2,400 Kenyan government workers, we began to educate them. And in that event, who were scheduled to come? They were uh, the president's uh, cabinet members were to come and to give a greeting. And after the mind education was done, 
So the president's head of the state's affairs committee was giving a speech. And after, at the closing, the head of the state affairs also came out to give a speech. And that was the end of the morning set of events. And after the morning, morning time was over, it was lunchtime, so we all went to go eat lunch. And while we were on our way to eat lunch, they invited me over to the table where the head of the state affairs committee was at. And so we got to eat together. This is the cafeteria where we were all eating together. And so, we had our food in the tray, we had it on, and we, as we were eating together, I didn't eat, I just had my laptop open, and I gave him mind education. And while he was eating, he stopped eating, and he was listening to mind education. And after he listened to mind education all the way through, he said, the, and the suggestion he made to us is, tomorrow morning, I want you to come into the presidential palace. When you come into the presidential palace, all this that mind education you gave me today, tell the president exactly what you told me today. And the president, I think, really needs to hear this. And so suddenly, we were invited to the presidential palace. And we were invited, so we went, and the president, we went in early in the morning, and the morning president was not available, and he came in the afternoon. And this is the presidential palace. And he continued to tour me through the presidential palace. So we sat down again, and we had the mind education again, and we were to talk about the gospel again, and this is how we spent our time together. And in the afternoon, the president himself came out, and he, he's uh, President Kenyatta. And the president and we were in the event venue for a very long time, I think. And just like that, we gave the president the mind education, we explained it to him, and certain days, certain months, we're going to have our founder coming into Kenya to visit. And during that time, Mr. President, if you have the time, then please, let's have a time to make an appointment to meet together. And the president said he's going to check his time. So he's going to check his schedule. And he says, oh, at certain times, I'm going to be available, so come during that time. And he said, yes, Mr. President. Mr. President, in order for you to invite our founder, Mr. President, you need to write us an invitation letter. And said, oh, really? Okay, I'll, have, I'll make sure I have that done. So we went with him from the presidential palace. We were together with him for a little while. We took pictures together. And we brought our little Santas over. We took another, again, pictures. And this is how we spent our time together. And just like that, the Mr. President went to every department of Kenya so that we can have mind education. He had opened up ways for us. Now, here, why am I talking about this? Because in the beginning, pastor told me, within this year, do all the state prisons of Korea, uh, do all the prisons of Korea, and go to all the prisons in the world and make a movie and write a book and run a prison. And this is how he spoke to me. If it was like you, when you hear something impossible like this, what do you first think? No way. That's impossible. How am I supposed to make all this happen? Airplane prices alone, where am I going to get that money? That's what I was thinking at first. When those thoughts came up within me, that's when Pastor said, Everyone, you may hear everything, but one thing you must never listen to is this. 
that God is not working. That is one thing you must never listen to. God will surely work through you. Inside my heart, when I heard something impossible, I would always... The people who are entering prison have no choice but to go to prison. They have a mindset for that. I couldn't get accustomed to going to school. I couldn't get accustomed to living in society. I couldn't get accustomed to living in prison. And even after receiving salvation, all I did was receive salvation, but that heart, I have never once changed it. And until now, until five years ago, I think I've been living the same way. Even as I was living in the life of ministry, when there were difficulties, I think to myself, I don't think God listens to me. I don't think God works in me. I think God dislikes me. And as I, as I would go through some problem in my ministry, I would think, oh no, I got to quit. I got to stop. And there were too many times when I was just trying to quit my ministry. But why is it that these things are happening? Because at the time, five years ago, the pastor told us, in your hearts, the words saying, God is not working in you, get rid of them, erase them. God is surely going to work. And in my heart, God is not going to work. I kept that. That's how I left my ministry. And with that thought, I, can, I received salvation. And re even before receiving salvation, I always had those thoughts. Because I didn't believe in God at the time. But after receiving salvation, at times, when I'm in the middle of my ministry, when problems would come, I would say, Nope, gotta quit. I don't think God's working in me. I think I can't do this anymore. I gotta quit. But five years ago, that's when Pastor gave us this fellowship and said, In your heart, the words saying that this is not gonna work, you have to erase them. You have to erase those words absolutely, otherwise, God's not going to work. When Pastor was telling me, Do all the prisons of the world, if it was like me before, I would say, No, how is that possible? I can't do that. That's impossible, Pastor. Pastor's just telling me to just have a big heart. That's the way that I've been living my life until now, until just five years ago. But in my heart, as I was getting, as I was erasing those words, God's not working in me, in my heart. Whenever there are difficulties or problems that always come up, I would always say, no, God is surely going to work. Those are the thoughts that began to arise in me. And when he told me, you have to do all the prisons of, all the, all the, prisons of the world, you have to finish all the prisons of Korea by this year, you run the prison now, make a movie, write a book, he told me all these things, but then, in my heart, God is surely going to work, I began to think. And so we had our first prison and uh, prison commissioners uh, forum. And as we had our first prison uh, prison commissioners forum, the, uh, the general commissioner for prisons of Kenya brought a concern with him to me, and I had no idea he had this concern. So he came to Korea, got his concern taken care of, and he, uh, he would go back to Kenya, and he would invite me. And when he would invite me, he would request us to do a theology school program. And after we have the theology school program, we would have the enrollment ceremony, and then two years later, we're going to have our graduation ceremony, then the VIPs, many congressmen will come. Many Kenyan media will be there as well. And the top congressman of Kenya came over and came on the graduation day for all the inmates and he is going to be so touched in his heart. And after he becomes so touched and the chairman of the, uh, chairman of the government workers will in invite us to 3,700 members of the government workers and during the internship education they're going to introduce us to do the mind education to them. And when we do the mind education uh, for them for one week, on the last day, the head of the State Affairs Committee is going to come from the President. And the head of the State Affairs Committee is going to come and he's going to in invite us to join him for the meal and do a mind education with him and he's going to open up his heart. And he is also going to be touched. And after he gets touched, he's going to invite us to the Presidential Palace. And God is going to allow us to meet the President of Kenya. And uh, 
President Kenyatta is going to hear this education and he is going to be so touched. And he is going to open up ways for us to have mind education for the government workers of Kenya. And he's going to allow us to do this education for wherever it is in Kenya, across the, across the country. Did we write that plan? If we knew this was going to happen, then when he told us to do all the prisons across the world, Oh yes sir, I would have said that. Yes, this is going to work, yes, God is going to work, absolutely. We did not even once imagine this would happen. You feed the 5,000 with five barley loaves. The disciples thought, what, this, this is not even worth for one person's meal. How am I supposed to feed 5,000 people with this? Philip decided to get his calculation down. And there's no calculation with this. But even so, when they're to give the food, when they're asked to give them food, what happened? As they continued to tear the bread, what happened? 5,000 people had bread enough and to spare, and they had 12 baskets full of food. Who would have known this would happen? Never once have we ever made this kind of plan before, but pastor said, you do all the prisons across the world. And in his words, was such detailed plan of God prepared for me every everywhere across the world so that we could go all over the world all the plans were in there and when we went but when we tell ourselves no and then we don't go then if I were to tell myself you know how much it is for airfare I can't handle any of this airfare I can't do that and if we did not do a prisoner a prisoner prison commissioners a forum then then there would be no way for us to meet the head commissioner of uh, Kenyan prisons. Then, there would be no reason for us to open a theology school in the Kenyan prisons. Then, there would be no reason for any VIP to come from Kenya. Then, that's, none of this would have happened. Then we would say, oh, God didn't work. God doesn't work through me. And that's the thought that I would continue to hold within me as I would live. Who would have thought that this is how God would have worked? We would have never even imagined this. Did we, did we write a plan for this? No, we didn't make a plan for this. So, do all the prisons across the world. God is surely going to work. And I took that first footstep, and that footstep continued to lead to God opening up the ways. Now today, there is a spiritual life of Saul and there is a spiritual life of David. Saul, Saul also got anointed with oil and established as the king of Israel. And David also was established after being anointed with oil. They're the same. David met with Goliath and so did Saul. But after Saul met with Goliath, he saw. And there went out a champion out of the camp of Philistines named Goliath Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 5, shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target between his target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. So a tremendous, impossible opponent had appeared. They had the same impossible things ahead of them, and the spiritual life of Saul and the spiritual life of light, uh, spiritual life of David, were different. Saul came across Goliath and he hid. I can't do this. How could I overcome Goliath? No matter what I do, I can't overcome Goliath. And like that, he ran away. But he met with the same Goliath. When David met Goliath, he started a fight with him. When David met Goliath, he started a fight with him. Then, God gave him the power to overcome Goliath. And so Goliath was overcome. Then why did Saul meet Goliath and avoid him? No, it's difficult, it's impossible. It didn't seem like God was going to work through him. Because it didn't seem like God was going to work, Saul couldn't go out to Goliath. That was Saul's spiritual life. Saul kept in his heart the heart to believe that God is not going to work and he lived his spiritual life 
And that is how he served God. How about David? I am but a child, and I am lacking, but when I bring my stone sling, God is surely going to work. So David was armed with the name of the Lord, and he began to fight Goliath, and he threw his stone sling, and somehow, miraculously, he had a helmet on, but the rock pierced his forehead. And David won the war. And what do you think David was thinking? Wow, I almost died just now. I almost died. I have no idea what a trouble that was. See if I ever go to battle ever again. I'll never go to battle ever again. Do you think that's what he thought? David would never ever think that. David, after fighting Goliath, he'll say, Wow! And he's so happy. God truly did this. God worked. After David fought with Goliath, God helped David. God also, in Saul and in David, he gave them both the power to overcome Goliath. He gave them the same amount of power. But, God could no longer work through Saul. God doesn't appear through Saul anymore. So God could no longer use him, so he abandoned Saul. Why was that? He gave Saul the same power to overcome Goliath. But Saul felt that God was not going to work through him, so he avoided the battle. Because he avoided the battle, God could no longer work through Saul. But David, he met no conditions at all, but he began to fight against Goliath. He, he started the fight. And truly, people who live by faith alone know this. So disciples saw that this is not enough to even feed one person. These five barley loaves and two fish, when they started tearing it off, what happened? They had more than 12 baskets enough to spare. And that's really amazing. What in the world? What in the world? How could this be? How could five loaves of bread end up with 12 baskets? This is not in man's calculation. So when they started tearing it off and giving it out, what happened? God was working. God was working. Even though it was impossible, David started that fight against Goliath and what happened? God, through David, worked amazingly. Saul, met Goliath and ran away. And through Saul, God no longer works. At this time, there are people who live spiritual lives like Saul. And there are those who live spiritual life like David. In David's heart, he thinks if when I go, God is surely going to work. God is going to help. But Saul, he received salvation by God and even as he was serving God, he thinks God, can, God may not help. There are times when God may not help. And that's how, when you live your spiritual life like that, it's no fun at all. In our lives, in our hearts, God is surely going to work. The thought thinking that God is not going to work must be erased. And in our hearts, we must say, God is surely going to work through me once we're able to believe in that truth. Now in your hearts, get rid of the thought thinking that God is not going to work in you. God is surely going to work. When you get to have that heart. Once you can change your thoughts once, then 300 times, one person can be 300 times, 500 times, and God is going to do that work. Amazing, tremendous work. God is going to make that work happen. Jonathan and his armor bearer goes to war. And the opponents, they have 30,000 iron chariots. They have 6,000 cavalry foot soldiers. There are as many as the sands of the sea. The Philistines had 30,000 chariots, 6,000 cavalry, and the people were numbering so much so that they were like the sand grains in the sea. But the two went to the war with him. This is not 300 times more. This is few million times more. So two of them went. 
They went climbing up a valley. Let's go. It may be that the Lord may work for us. They went with the faith to believe in God. But when they went there, the two of them, how would they subdue an army so big like them? There are 30,000 chariots, 6,000 cavalry, and there are so many people that you cannot count as many as the sands, uh, sands in the sea. But when they went to war with them, what in the world? What in the world? All of a sudden, there was a huge trembling in the earth. And there was a huge trembling. And there was a trembling. And people had lost their minds. They started taking their swords and spears and started killing each other with them. They had friendly fire. They killed each other. And that is what Jonathan and the armor bearer saw. After that war was over, what heart do you think they had? Wow, spiritual life is so tiring. This is so difficult. This is so burdensome. I almost died. I'm never going to go back there again. Do you think that's the heart they felt? Wow. How moved were they? God was alive right next to us. And in that war, God was working so miraculously and He was overcoming all these uh, Philistines and they feel so thankful. And they would say, I can't say that I fought in this war. I didn't win this war. God made that work. And when you have war like that, then the next time, you would want to go back there again. Wow, war, let's go again. Philistines, let's go to war again with them. Whatever difficulties or whatever troubles may come. Yeah, that's right, let's go. God is surely going to work. Wouldn't they feel that way? When David stood in front of Goliath, God was working and he saw that. He saw God helping him. And God also worked in David and also in Saul. Just the same way, God gave Saul the power to overcome. But Saul met a thing called Goliath and he ran away. And so, God could no longer work through Saul. Because God wouldn't appear through him. So God abandoned Saul. But David met against Goliath and he started a fight with him. And God gave him the strength to overcome Goliath. God gave him the same power, but through Saul, God could not appear. But through David, God would work. In this age, there are two kinds of spiritual lives. There are people who live spiritual lives like Saul. There are people who live spiritual lives like David. Everyone, which spiritual life do you live? Do you live the spiritual life of Saul? When there are difficulties, you avoid them. When there are hardships, you avoid them, saying, no, this is difficult, this is impossible. And in your heart, you keep the thought thinking that God is not working in you. That's why you avoid it, right? Because it's difficult. If you believe that God is surely going to work, then you're going to go and collide with it. In David's heart, God is surely going to work. That's the way he felt. So always he would start a fight. No matter what difficulties there were, no matter what problems he came across, God would give us the power to overcome all the difficulties and all the troubles. When we come across the problems with the faith to believe in that, then as God would see, believe that God would give you deliverance. And there's this one thing that you must do today, and that is, today, in your hearts, get rid of the word saying that you can't. Erase the thought thinking that God is not going to work. Erase those thoughts. And spiritual life is where God is not working. Get rid of those thoughts. Get rid of those thoughts and just live with only one thing. Then you'll be as happy as if you're living in a dream. And you try that for a month and if you find yourself very happy, then do that for the rest of your life and erase those words for the rest of your life. No matter what you do, it would seem as though that it can work. And through us, just as this work appeared through David, then I really hope that the work of God appears in you just as well. We'll go as far as this for today. We'll finish. Thank you.